2024 is a big year for democracy. This year, more people will cast a ballot than in any other year in history. We're talking half the world's entire population. Unfortunately, many of those votes won't make a lick of difference. Because while those elections will look and feel genuine, they won't be. Let me explain. Today, an increasing number of people live in nations experiencing democratic backsliding, a moving away from democratic norms and toward autocratic ones. According to Varieties of Democracy, a decade ago, just under half of the world lived under autocratic regimes. But as of this year, that number has risen to over 70%. You might ask, how does that work? If more and more people are living in autocracies, why are there more elections than ever? That seems contradictory. Here's how it went down. When the Cold War ended, it looked to many as if liberal democracy had finally won the day. But what we didn't account for was the resurgence of states that incorporated the elements of democracy, but only superficially. We call these regimes electoral autocracies. Electoral autocracies are democratic at face value, but beyond that, do little to live up to the title. The flow of information tends to be highly regulated. Opposition is repressed through a variety of legal and extra-legal means, sometimes violently so. And the elections themselves range from carefully managed and manipulated to outright fraudulent. But to those in power, it doesn't matter. They can deploy hollowed out electoral events to cement their power while preserving the facade of democracy. Why? Why do they need elections when the result is ensured in advance? Why hold elections at all? It turns out that, shocker, elections are powerful. And it's not hard to see why. An election conveys a sense that it is the people who are choosing their leaders. In effect, the elected party has the backing of the masses. This is why the political scientist Brian Kloss has argued we shouldn't call what happens in autocracies elections, but rather election-style events. Elections are supposed to offer representation to the people, allow citizens to voice their discontent with their rulers. But those carried out by autocratic regimes involve the pageantry and ritual of voting without real democracy. So here's why autocratic leaders who value their powers and not the common good of the people, insist on holding election-style events. Every vote should count. You have no choice but to vote for me. There's something less than free and fair. I alone can fix it. This is an assault on democracy. Winning an election is a legitimizing event. It's a public result the autocrat can point to, at home, in the international arena, and everywhere else, as evidence they are rightfully or justifiably in power, that it is the people who have empowered them. Once autocrats get the backing of their people, it becomes very hard for other countries to ignore them and treat them as somehow illegitimate, because that would be sliding not the autocrat, but all those who voted for them. Voting gives them domestic legitimacy and international legitimacy. India's Narendra Modi is a great example of this point. In 2002, Modi failed to stop, and some argued, condoned a wave of anti-Muslim violence in his home state of Gujarat, where he was then chief minister. In the aftermath, his diplomatic visa to the US was revoked, and he was even denied entry as a tourist. This was followed by bans from the UK and an informal persona non grata status across the rest of the EU. But once he was elected to prime minister in 2014, countries started rolling out the red carpet because he represented the will of the Indian people. Obama hosted a state dinner with Modi in 2014. He was Emmanuel Macron's guest of honor at the 2023 Bastille Day Parade. Mark Zuckerberg hosted a town hall with him as a guest during which Modi forced this hilariously awkward hug. Modi, at the time, 
won a mostly free and fair election. But here's the thing. To leverage this legitimacy, these elections often merely need to appear democratic. Outside of a few outliers, authoritarians have learned that claiming to have won 100% of the vote outright provides little benefit. Instead, even a poorly veiled faux democracy can grant a regime an air of legitimacy. Vladimir Putin famously strives to reach what he calls the 70-70 rule. 70% 70 voter turnout, 70% of which vote for him. To Putin, it's just enough to demonstrate both strength and validity. But when he won a record 87% of the votes in this year's election, commentary focused on how such a landslide victory might actually hurt Putin more than it helps. He points to the margin of victory as proof of mass support. But the forced turnout by public employees, online voting push, and specious results from war-torn and illegally annexed regions paint his win as an outright sham. But within their borders, authoritarians use elections for very different reasons. On a practical level, elections allow authoritarians to gain information they might otherwise have trouble pinning down. Dictators face a dilemma in that they can't ever truly know what the population thinks of them. Some regimes use surveillance methods of secret police and informants to keep tabs on their citizens. But this carries risk and isn't as reliable. So elections begin to be used for these purposes. Campaigns and elections allow regimes to test both the popularity of platforms and the loyalty of their followers be it with voters or their elite lieutenants. They can then use the information to reward or punish. Mexico, for example, operated under an electoral autocracy for the last 70 years of the 20th century, albeit under the control of a party rather than a singular ruler. The Institutional Revolution Party, or PRI, used information gathered from elections to both reward and punish leaders and voters from municipalities that demonstrated opposition. By actively reorganizing government funds in a highly volatile and constantly changing distribution. Following the 1988 election, municipalities more aligned with opposition outcomes received between 17 and 14 and a half pesos per capita less in public spending than PRI affiliated ones. And as the margin of victory increased, so did per capita funds, showcasing a direct link between public spending and regime support in elections. It all comes down to the autocrat asking, who is loyal and who isn't? And then using elections as a tool to force fealty. In other words, the most crucial function of elections in authoritarian states is power consolidation. Once authoritarians know who is loyal and who isn't, they can get to work cementing their place. Despite introducing an element of risk against their grip on power, because it does give the disgruntled some political means to register their discontent, authoritarians know that elections have a huge upside. So it's a risk worth taking. Elections also give authoritarians an opportunity while campaigning to stoke the fires of conflict, whip populist furies, and maintain their grip on power. I was the one to save this nation, and I'm the only one who still can. Even in more competitive elections, authoritarians can use their official authority to dilute the power of the opposition. They can do so by engineering wide margins of victory to dishearten competitors, by using legal mechanisms to deem only some candidates as worthy of participation, or by simply dividing the vote amongst multiple competitors, sometimes without the opposition even realizing it. For instance, during the 2021 municipal elections in St. Petersburg, Russia, Boris Vishnevsky, a member of the liberal Yablika party, was hopeful for a possible seat in the Russian Duma. But just a few months before, two of his competitors legally had their names changed to, get this, Boris Vishnevsky, in an attempt to confuse voters who would unintentionally split the vote. 
Even photographs of the candidates couldn't get around this move. The two new Borises just grew beards and shaved their heads, or at least tried to do so in Photoshop. This might be an extreme example, but once the opposition has been defeated by hook or by crook, authoritarians can go about delegating smaller degrees of authority to their allies, sharing the loot through powerful appointments, valuable contracts, and prestige. What might be seen as brazen cronyism in non-elected contexts suddenly is given a veneer of legitimacy, while simultaneously shoring up state capacity to exercise control over citizens. So it turns out that authoritarian regimes use voting less as an institutional mechanism for practicing liberal democracy and more as a pageant to stabilize their grip on authority. Research has found elections tend to introduce a small window of high instability around a regime by rallying opposition, but also that they stabilize regime power in the long term by providing ample opportunities to co-opt legal means of repression. And if you think this isn't important because where you live has robust means of conducting safe and fair elections, it's probably worth being a little more cautious. Many once thriving liberal democracies have experienced degrees of democratic backsliding. Just look at Donald Trump. The very same day he was inaugurated in January 2017, he filed to become a candidate in 2020, earlier than any candidate in American history. He kept his campaign team in place, and in less than a month, he was conducting a victory tour all across the country. When Trump lost the 2020 election, those events transformed into opportunities to deny the validity of the outcome allowing him to amplify baseless conspiracy theories, encourage violence against poll workers, and incite an attempted coup. These campaign rallies in all but name, literal election-style events, underscore Trump's understanding that elections and campaigning are an extremely powerful way to fuel his populist base, keep channels open with his loyal followers, and provide cover for his alleged criminal actions. He doesn't serve his office. Elections serve his purpose, namely to show off his popular support. He has brought a fundamentally authoritarian approach to the home of liberal democracy.